We often discuss our future in the asteroid belt, and the glorious civilizations we might one day build there, however, it is but a pale shadow of its larger twin, the Kuiper Belt, out at the edge of the solar system. When I was a kid, we were first beginning to seriously discuss the possibility that the asteroid belt might be as important to settling space as the Moon, Mars, or Venus, and indeed I think it's more critical to settling the solar system than Mars or Venus are, and second only to the Moon. However, if the asteroid belt is the gateway to colonizing our solar system, it is the Kuiper Belt, out past Neptune, that represents the gateway to the galaxy, and today we'll discuss why that is and what that future looks like. In order to do that, we first need to say what the Kuiper Belt is. The Kuiper Belt is a region out past the orbit of Neptune of many unattached minor planets and icy objects orbiting our Sun. We typically define it as a donut or torus-shaped region stretching from 30 to 50 astronomical units, also known as AU, where 1 AU is the distance of Earth from the Sun. As such, it contains a larger volume in it than the entire inner solar system. The name is in honor of Gerard Kuiper, the astronomer who discovered two of the bigger moons of Neptune and Uranus, and also helped identify landing sites on our own moon for the Apollo missions. He was also the PhD dissertation director for Carl Sagan, and the two of them worked on Project A119, the US Air Force's 1958 plan to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon. Those are the highlights of a rather impressive career on astronomy and planetary science up until his death in 1973 but one that had nothing to do with the Kuiper Belt, except that many of the moons of Neptune might have been stolen from the inner edge of that belt. Indeed, at the time of his death, there was only one known Kuiper Belt object, Pluto itself. The second wouldn't be discovered until 1978, Pluto's largest moon, Charon. Then the next to be discovered was Albion, a minor planet over 100 kilometers across, in 1992. We estimate there are at least 100,000 objects in the Albion size range out in the Kuiper Belt, objects over 100 kilometers in diameter or 60 miles, whereas there are only about 200 asteroids in the asteroid belt that size, which would mean there were roughly 500 times as many of those large objects, if not more. It is the loose rule of thumb that the number of objects of a given size follows a power law, that there are a lot more smaller objects than big ones, though we do see bumps at 100 kilometers and 5 kilometers in diameter. As an example, while there are about 250 known asteroid belt objects 100 kilometers across or bigger, there are tens of thousands that are 5 kilometers or wider. If that distribution held in the Kuiper Belt, though it probably does not or does so more weakly, we would expect tens of millions of objects 5 kilometers or wider out there, big mountain-sized balls of ice and rock. As a caveat, we tend to believe that asteroids in the asteroid belt that are wider than 120 kilometers are mostly the battered but intact remnants of an original asteroid from the early solar system, and that most of those which are smaller are scattered debris of those larger ones. Insofar as the Kuiper Belt is much larger and slower moving, it would stand to reason that collisions and fragmentation were less common. Nonetheless, we estimate the Kuiper Belt to be anywhere between 20 to 200 times as massive as the asteroid belt. Pluto was not the only large object out there, it was the discovery of many others that led to needing to demote it from major planet status. The dwarf planets of Orcus, Huame, Quayor, and Makamake fall inside the Kuiper Belt, and except for Orcus, which is a bit smaller, each of those is larger than Ceres, the queen of the asteroid belt, often argued to be Planet 5, which makes up roughly a third of the asteroid belt's mass, with another third made of around a dozen other large asteroids and the remaining thought making up the millions of other bodies that are at least as wide as a football field. We have way more categories for plants these days than major and minor, with dwarf being the first of several added categories as we learn more about exoplanets, but Pluto wasn't the first planet demoted. Before we even discovered Neptune, let alone the Kuiper Belt beyond it, we had discovered Ceres and a handful of other large asteroids in the asteroid belt, and we didn't even know there was a belt there. They got demoted to minor planets after we started finding dozens of them, and that soon moved into thousands, and eventually resulting in us recognizing that the asteroid belt was divided into at least three distinct regions, and that there were tons of other asteroids elsewhere too, including 60 degrees ahead and behind of Jupiter, where there are two massive collections of asteroids named for the Trojan and Greek heroes of Homo's Iliad, 
and it later turned out that such collections on a smaller scale were normal for planets, and are generally called Trojans, at what we call the L4 and L5 Lagrange points, much as more modest rings are present for planets besides Saturn whose immense rings include many football field sized objects and larger. So while focus on colonization of the solar system tended to focus on the terrestrial major planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, plus Earth's own large moon, we began seeing the moons of the gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and the two ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, as viable options too, if not classically terraformable due to the low mass and distance from the Sun. But all those asteroids and other minor planets began looking like very good candidates too, in their countless thousands, and realizing the Kuiper Belt far outnumbered all those minor planets in the inner system changed the dynamics a lot. Now the problems with the asteroid belt are threefold. First, even the nearest of them is out past Mars and gets weak sunlight, generally about one-fifth to one-tenth the sunlight Earth gets, with Jupiter's Trojans being more like a thirtieth, and between the asteroid belt and Jupiter's Trojans that is the overwhelming majority of minor planets in the inner system. As we discussed in the episode Colonizing series, that actually is enough sunlight for agricultural purposes, there are no clouds and no nighttime attenuating sunlight in space, and many plants do not need noontime sunlight to prosper, nor is it hard to provide very good insulation to agricultural or habitation environments on these asteroids, as your best insulator is vacuum and it's already all around you, and airtight facilities are a necessity anyway. You can also set up a glass dome on the surface of a small asteroid to basically be a lens, or several of them, concentrating light on a smaller spot, or even construct a parabolic dish as thin as tinfoil behind an asteroid or tugged along by it on a tether to focus a larger amount of light on that asteroid. Indeed we even have a scaled up version of this called a parabolic cab that I will detail in a bit, that permits sunlight enhancement to livable levels all the way out in the Kuiper Belt where sunlight is a thousandth of what we're used to here on Earth. But sunlight is a weak fuel for most asteroids, very few are closer to the Sun than Earth, and of the 30,000 known near-Earth asteroids, only a minority spend much time closer to the Sun than Earth, and usually only briefly, be in our highly elliptical orbits. These gems are likely to be among the most valuable real estate and mining sites in the solar system in times to come. The second issue with colonizing asteroids and dwarf planets is gravity, and that applies to all of them regardless of location. Out of the many millions of these objects, only maybe a hundred even have high enough gravity to even qualify as significant. The most massive dwarf planet, Eris, which lies out in the scattered disk rather than the Kuiper Belt, still has less than a tenth of Earth's gravity and is weaker than our own moons, whereas Nemesis, the 33rd largest known asteroid in the asteroid belt, at about 100 miles across, would have a gravity less than 1% of Earth's, and an escape velocity also less than 1% of Earth's, about three times faster than a car on a freeway, and it only gets lower thereafter, with most asteroids not even having enough gravity to hold you onto them if you jumped. Now this isn't really a problem and indeed is also a plus for colonizing them. We can create a comfortable simulacrum of gravity by rotation what we call spin gravity, and while that can be problematic on bigger objects where natural gravity would be pulling you in one direction while you spun perpendicular to it, causing a slight tilt to one side, or parallel, causing you to feel slightly heavier or lighter as you complete each rotation, this can be basically disregarded even on a place like Nemesis, again the 33rd biggest known asteroid in the main belt. And while the Kuiper Belt is expected to hold many bodies bigger than that, they will generally be lower density ices rather than principally rock, and thus have lower gravity. So we can embed a rotating habitation drum, set to the gravity of our choosing, inside any of these objects, providing comfortable gravity for those living there, where it can receive both the protection of that rock or ice outside and easy access to those resources for mining and refining. As there is little gravity, mining those resources and shipping them elsewhere is easy, and a spaceship designed for moving between asteroids and off them needs little more than to be airtight, and could even run on a compressed gas rocket or by mechanically shoving off objects, opening the door to personal spacecraft that are lower tech than the typical modern car. With no air drag for leaving, it takes less fuel to get off your typical asteroid than it would take to drive a car to the store, and for the most part, Since the Sun and inner planets are all downhill in gravitational terms, 
you can throw mined matter back into the solar system at low cost. The third issue with colonizing asteroids though is that matter and resources you want to mine, because the entire asteroid belt combined, even including the dwarf planet Ceres, masses only about 3-4% of what our moon does, 60% of which is in the four biggest asteroids, and Earth outmasses our moon by a factor of 80, so Earth itself has thousands of times the raw materials the entire asteroid belt has. And while the Kuiper Belt might outmass the Asteroid Belt by as much as a factor of 200, that would still only be a tenth of what Earth has. Of course if you ignore the Sun and the giant planets, Earth masses nearly as much as the entire remaining solar system combined, most of the remainder being in Venus. Now if your goal is to disassemble every single planet for raw materials to build space habitats and an eventual Dyson Swarm, this matters but in the meantime they represent the lowest hanging fruit for mining and supplying colonization. Scale is always deceptive in astronomical terms, as we can say some giant asteroid like Nemesis is still only a millionth of Earth's mass, which sounds pitifully tiny, but in terms of mining or human scale, that is over a billion great pyramids worth of mass, and a million times more steel than we currently produce each year. Iron and carbon are quite plentiful in the main asteroid belt, we assume less so in the Kuiper belt and scattered disk as a percentage of mass, but they would still have plenty for building spaceships and space stations and power collectors and dishes and habitats out of. They are also very rich in water ice and ammonia and methane, those volatiles that are very important for life and filling the biospheres of those space habitats, or biocylinders or bio rings as the case may be. Either belt, main asteroid or Kuiper belt, or for that matter the Jovian Trojans or near-Earth asteroids or scattered disk, are all pitifully tiny compared to the raw mass of the eight major planets, but it is vastly more accessible, especially for building in space, and each of those contains far more resources than mankind has ever mined or refined, or even tilled. If you crumble up an asteroid like Nemesis and spread it over our whole planet, seas and all, it would represent about a meter deep of Earth, which also means you can take an asteroid about that size or a Kuiper Belt object about that size and produce enough cylinder habitats to have a combined total internal living area roughly matching the entire Earth. And there's a thousand times that mass and more in the main belt alone, and again we think the Kuiper Belt has 20-200 to times as much, so thousands of Earth's worth of living area made from asteroid belt objects, and potentially many more times that with the Kuiper Belt all before we even have to consider disassembling big ol' moons or any of the major planets. It is hard to say whether it would be easier to ship a big comet in from the Kuiper Belt to put air and water in a space habitat built in orbit around Earth, or to ship it in from one of the moons of the various giant planets. The big limitation is about your access to energy and how much of a rush you are in, and everything gets easier if you've got artificial fusion power or something even better to the point that you might not care much about the energy cost to move a million tons of water or ammonia or methane around because the amount is so trivial compared to what you would get by fusing the hydrogen or deuterium inside that megaton. And usually discussing colonizing the outer solar system is in the context of a fusion economy, but let's say for the moment that we never make that work economically, can we still colonize the outer reaches of the solar system, those outer planets and the Kuiper Belt and scattered disk? And, incidentally, what is the scattered disk and how is it different from the Kuiper Belt? For colonization purposes today they are basically the same and the boundary can be a bit hazy in astronomical terms too. As mentioned at the beginning, the Kuiper Belt is a donut or torus-shaped region in the same general plane around the Sun as Earth and most of the planets are, and the asteroid belt too. Think of the scattered disk as an expanding wide disk from the edge of the Kuiper Belt to the more spherical shell of the Oort Cloud. Essentially, space is rather evenly distributed in the interstellar void, but the area more dominated by the Sun's gravity and the solar system's initial angular momentum as it formed tends to flatten toward a disk, the ecliptic plane, which the planets generally are aligned to, and the further you get from the Sun, the more things scatter away from being that disk-shaped scattering of objects to being more of a spherical distribution of the Oort Cloud. There is no real official limit on the scattered disk and where it ends, more than 100 AU certainly, and to encompass all the outer planets beyond Pluto like Eris or Far Out, 
or the current tidal hurdle for most distant known objects inside the solar system, fall far out, which might be a dwarf planet about 500 kilometers in diameter over 130 AU out, and orbiting the Sun every 700 years or so. It is hard for us to see it precisely, but we think it might have a very eccentric orbit and actually cross inside the Kuiper Belt or even Neptune's orbit, as Pluto does. Interesting factoid but Pluto was the 8th planet rather than the 9th from 1979 to 1999, returning to beyond Neptune's orbit shortly before its demotion. Such being the case, in the grand scheme of solar colonization, where Kuiper and scattered disk objects orbit once every century or longer, and many very eccentrically, you might have colonization and trade that began or peaked or dipped as they got closer to the Sun, perihelion, as opposed to most distant from the Sun, aphelion. Are they too far from the Sun though for us to live on without fusion? Channel regulars probably wouldn't be surprised to hear me say no, and here are three ways we might colonize these spots without practical cheap fusion. First, we might simply use classic nuclear fission, there's plenty of uranium and thorium out in the solar system. Second, we can beam energy out from closer to the Sun, it's not the easiest thing in the world to focus a beam that far out though. Your typical laser pointer's dot is apparently spread out to be about 4 miles wide by the time it would reach our moon, which is only a 400th of an AU, so a dot an AU away on, say, Mars, or a near-Earth asteroid would be around 1600 miles across, the size of Pluto. It would be 40 times bigger than that by the time it reached Pluto too, more or less in the middle of the Kuiper Belt. It is possible to build an energy collector that big of course, it hardly needs to be very thick after all, just tin foil thick. Our preferred medium for power transmission is usually microwaves, how tight a beam is focused is generally linear to wavelength and microwaves are already a thousand to a million times the wavelength of the tip of photon being emitted by the Sun. However, the spot also gets narrower based on the original beam size. Bigger is better. Your typical laser pointer beam is around a millimeter in diameter when it leaves the device, so one of four 10 meters wide, or 10,000 millimeters, would be 10,000 times tighter. So instead of four miles on the moon, a couple feet or half a meter, and at 40 AU, about 1.6 miles across, or about 5 million square meters. This might be some large statite or lagite you built in near Mercury beaming out gigawatts to that station, something they own, or they might be getting it from an auction out of billions of different solar power collectors around the inner system. The problem is though, this distance is a very serious amount of juice that's also tight. Even if that beam were down to 1000 watts per square meter when it arrived, akin to the intensity of noontime sunlight, That means it is transmitting 5 gigawatts when it left the original platform at an intensity of 67 megawatts per square meter, just a little brighter than the surface of the Sun. So not something you want to stand in front of, and it would represent a potential hazard to pretty much anything in the inner system that crossed its path, though only things within a million kilometers or so would really need to view it as a death ray and odds are that any ship moving around inside Mercury's orbital radius is already very mirrored up to protect from solar heating. I'd say it's doable and probably reasonably safe, and this same power transmission apparatus is great for moving ships out to those places or even up to interstellar speeds. As we discussed in Colonizing Pluto, which again is roughly in the middle of the Kuiper Belt, a ship undergoing constant 1G acceleration to Pluto at 40 AU shoved by a beam would take 18 days to get there, assuming it was planning to flip over and do a 1G deceleration for the second half. If you were just flat out accelerating, 13 days to go and at about 2.6% light speed. If you're curious, 30 to 50 AU for the Kuiper Belt is 4 or 7 light hours of communication time each way. Everything in the Kuiper Belt is 16 to 20 days travel time from Earth as a 1G turn and burn maneuver and a flat out acceleration to the edge of the Kuiper Belt would get you to 4% of light speed, and 100 AU out, just over 6%. The scattered disk keeps going beyond that, though once you're out to 1000 to 2000 AU we'd be transitioning into the Oort Cloud, and at 2000 AU of constant 1G acceleration that would be 90 days, and you're going a quarter of light speed at that point. To reach something there at 1G, turnover is at day 64, at a speed of 18% light speed, 
and you arrive 128 days after departure, and a message there and back takes 23 days. See our episode Colonizing the Oort Cloud for more discussion of living out there. Back in the Kuiper Belt though, while I could see passenger ships moving that fast, it would necessitate either a longer trip back or a more expensive one where the return beam and laser for slowing you was generated at the site, with presumably a big loss in bouncing or catching and re-emitting that beam after transferring into electricity and back into a laser. It is also hugely power wasteful, which might be okay in that era though. Again on your general path to a Dyson swarm of habitats, or giant computers, you presumably eventually disassemble most planets, even the giants, or starlift the sun full of metals, as it has way more than every planet combined, and indeed a billion times the mass of the asteroid belt, and around 10 million times the metals. In such an era, where collecting all the power of the sun really only requires enough metal to make a paper thin tinfoil ball around the sun in Neo Mercury, and we will be talking about the mass of one of those larger asteroids at that point, though not necessarily one of the top tier like Vesta, maybe as little as 10 to the 18 kilograms. During this phase, where lots of automation is probably in play, and the human race is probably still well short of a trillion people, or maybe low trillions, you could potentially have growing colonies on every asteroid already but have largely englobed the Sun, especially its polar regions where the light isn't hitting any objects in the solar system, just shining out to nowhere. As wasteful as it sounds, it might not be viewed as a very big deal, when every human alive, if given an equal share, might have a hundred terawatts of power production at their disposal, and you would need about 14 terawatts to push 10 tons of ship, which would seem a plausible amount for a single person in their accommodation, which would permit 27 trillion folks traveling this way at any given moment, if that's all we use the power for and entirely efficiently. If our population doubled every century, it wouldn't be until 3200 AD before we might feel the pinch on this sort of travel method, which assumed really good automation for production but no fusion power or better options. We would likely also see something more like an upgun solo moth, where power is sent out to the ship to be bounced into superheating a propellant acquired from the area. You can use this to move an entire comet inward by beaming power to it and absorbing it rather than reflecting it gaining some momentum, but then using that power to superheat ice on the other side as its rocket plane toward the solar system, which far more than cancels out, hurling you inward. You could also use this to shove the objects deeper into space too as interstellar craft. This is one option for interstellar colonization, as we looked at earlier this year in using asteroids and comets as spaceships. You core out some rock or ice ball a couple kilometers across and use that as your shielding in space and as your slow down fuel or propellant on arrival. It also saves some energy, as the escape velocity from the solar system in the vicinity of Earth is 94,000 miles per hour or 151,000 kilometers per hour. Out there, the escape velocity is nearly nothing, so that's a lot of velocity and fuel you're saving from launching an arc ship from there. Indeed the escape velocity is so low that if you had to, you could create a rotating habitat colony inside one of these icebergs and give it a decent supply of fission fuel, uranium or thorium or plutonium, and let it use a classic ion drive to head out into deep space. It might take 10,000 years to arrive at a new world, but you could run a decent sized civilization inside that rock, either having stockpiles of raw materials or mining them from it. You can use all that ice on an object from this area as propellant too, and move it much faster by hitting it with an energy beam from closer in system as we discussed, and at the other end, to slow down, just have a smaller Orion Drive vessel ready to launch from the big ship and run a bit ahead of it, slowing down using nukes and solar sails at the destination stall, and converting itself into an energy beam to hit the mothership with. Fundamentally you can run that enormous ship at around whatever speed you can achieve as your exhaust velocity for those ices it is mostly made of, when dumped into an ion drive or portion system of your choice. See the Advanced Spaceship Drive Compendium episode for more discussions of the options. Or at a smaller scale back home, just for more economically moving freight back into the system, probably powering an ion drive or even a flat out particle accelerator to get the highest exhaust velocity you can for your propellant. 
Key notion though is that a piece of matter given speed by a photon you beamed in to serve as the propellant does better than that photon bouncing off a ship does by itself, it just represents a finite supply of propellant. If the energy beaming trick does not work though, impractical or too dangerous, and fusion also doesn't become viable, and there aren't any ready supplies of uranium or thorium there, can we still run a civilization out in the Kuiper Belt and scattered disk, and if so, should we? This is where we get to the Parabolic Hab, a space habitat that has an enormous parabolic dish behind it as discussed in the Megastructural Compendium. To figure out its relative size, we just need to know how many AU the habitat is from the Sun, as 1 AU is normal surface lighting for Earth, and light falls off with a square of distance, also ignoring atmospheric attenuation. A parabolic dish 3 kilometers in radius at 30 AU from the Sun is going to gather the same sunlight as one 100 meters in radius out near Earth. Basically 2 pi hectares since you need a day and night cycle, or about 16 acres. Enough to feed a village worth of people, assuming you're efficiently using your sunlight to grow plants in a climate controlled environment like a greenhouse. That dish is probably in the zone of a ton per square or kilometer and you need 28 tons of dish at that point. Realistically you might build it heavier and you also probably want more power per person, but it is gathering about 40 megawatts of power. For those wanting to build out hypothetical ones, and keep the math easy, at 37 AU from the Sun, a given square kilometer of parabolic dish is gathering 1 megawatt of power or sunlight, and again ought to mass something like a ton, though that could go up a lot higher if you want thicker dishes or stronger structural members. I generally consider this sort of device to be recyclable, you build it out of hexagonal segments and let it get cut up and eroded by micrometeors and space dust and just detach and replace beat up segments and recycle the remaining material, which might be aluminum, iron, or even carbon. You could do it with ice as well but that's going to be heavier and your reflectivity or albedo on ice isn't as high as a mirror so you need more. It would also likely ablate ice off the surface faster than you'd lose metal. But be it a ton or a hundred tons per square kilometer, it's rather tiny compared to a rotating habitat, which might mass several megatons per square kilometer, and nothing compared to a classic planet. Earth masses almost 12 megatons per square meter, not kilometers, a million times more than a rotating habitat, and a billion to a trillion times what you need for a mirror. And if you find a nice rogue planet out there, as you might, even one way out in the periphery of the scattered disk, 1000 AU out, where you need a million times more light collecting surface than living area, that's just then getting into the zone where you spend as much mass on your parabolic dish or dishes as on your space habitat's living area, and still a tiny fraction of what a plant's mass would be to light it. In terms of setup, you could do two counter-rotating habitats, which adds stability, as we often imagine for actual O'Neill cylinders coming in pairs, and just move light from one to the other so it's light in one and dark on the other, though in practice I suspect you would have many different dishes and that your nighttime lighting would be going into mostly automated smaller agricultural stations, lighting those up, or run your nature preserve or force setup if you had one. If someone felt like rebooting the 1970s sci-fi film, Silent Running, this would probably be the approach to use to avoid the plot holes and issues with that film, some of them anyway. You could have a habitat out in very deep space, far from any humans who might harm it, or to be fair maintain it, being lit with an endless supply of sunlight. Not very stealthy incidentally being a giant mirror, but in terms of habitats, if we assumed every last icy rock out there big enough to be turned into a space hab was, we were probably looking at several billion giant icebergs in space, with some habitat in them ranging from a kaplana sized habitat buried in a snowball a kilometer across to hundreds of nested O'Neill cylinders in some continent sized ice ball. Those are spread over something like a million cubic AU, your default Dyson Swarm is stuffing a quadrillion such habitats into about 4-6 to six cubic AU and is still considerably less population dense than Montana, so you are very spread out in this area. 10 million miles or kilometers is probably the rough zone of distance between you and neighboring facilities at this point, the height of development, and that is a lot of breathing room. Millions of times the most rural places here on Earth. 
Your hair might be home to thousands or billions or even one lunatic and his robot assistants Huey, Dewey, and Louie, but a phone call next door takes a minute to get a response, which isn't bad, and unless you're feeling flush on energy, probably days to weeks of travel time. You might actually have a mobile agricultural hab that uses excess sunlight to move it slowly between various other facilities out there and had shuttles swing out to grab small ice chunks to replace lost mass from selling produce. You might be self-supporting and in isolation, running on fission or fusion or parabolic mirror or energy beam receiver, or have your micro black hole in the basement, and how stealthy this facility is depends on that. It might be a beaming relay to deep space, and an observatory, or a military radar outpost. It is a good place to be putting your forward defenses to intercept or fight anything coming in from another system, as just about any weapon you can imagine is safe to deploy out there, even self-replicating killbots as they would run out of matter. Fundamentally it is the hazy area between inside a solar system and true deep space, so I see it as a popular spot for those who want their elbow room but don't want to leave civilization entirely. You are within a calm lag time of a day to get messages to Earth and back, so email and social media still works fine, if we're being realistic, and someone living there could go visit others inside the solar system. Also if you are doing a lot of beam run ships, the Kuiper Belt is a good spot to place your beamers for pushing things from outside as almost all traffic is in that plane of orbit. This allows very quick travel and I suspect we will see it, if not for freight, than for passenger ships. You can move even quicker if we're considering uploaded mines and teleportation, it's also a magnificent place for doing computation where quarter is better for computing efficiency. You are out far enough that you are about as cold as you can get anywhere in the galaxy, so if humanity or some successor AI creation of ours goes digital, this is the preferred place for your civilization and you beam the energy out instead from the sun or run fusion plants or black hole generators here. All in all, you can have some very big and bright civilizations out there on the Kuiper Belt fall from the sun. Talking about the Kuiper Belt and harvesting rocks or ice balls for resources no longer seems like a thing of the unimaginably distant future, as it seems like we are finally returning to space in a big and ambitious way, and asteroid mining is likely to be part of that equation and sooner than later. This and so many other areas we used to think of as sci-fi, like AI, are now areas where more and more folks are making careers. Maybe you're thinking about a career in science and technology, or maybe you already have one, If so, as everyone in the tech world knows, if you're not staying ahead by building new skills, you're all falling behind. AI isn't the future, it is now, and to be part of the next tech revolution, you need to understand the core concept behind things like AI, neural networks, and machine learning, and the best place to learn them is at Brilliant.org. Brilliant is the best way to learn math and computer science interactively, they have thousands of lessons, from foundational and advanced math to AI, neural networks, space, rockets, and more, with new lessons being added monthly. Brilliant's visual, hands-on approach is such an effective and engaging way to learn, it makes building a daily learning habit easy. Interactive learning has been proven to be six times more effective than passive learning, like watching lecture videos, so Brilliant helps you learn by doing. Create programs with drag and drop coding, interact with charts and graphs, and play around with so many stunning visualizations. Brilliant makes it easy to build a daily learning habit, and you can try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days by visiting Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur or clicking on the link in the description, and the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So for anybody who's been wondering how my surgery on my tongue went or how the International Space Development Conference was, no news as of yet. I intentionally recorded this before then, and virtually everything for June too, in case I lost my voice for a time. I'd imagine if anything went unexpected I'd have mentioned it over on our community tab for this channel, and as a reminder, we do post general updates there occasionally, and it's also where I post the image polls for potential upcoming episodes. We've generally been doing that twice a month on a Sunday of late, typically offering a choice of four different episode topics and their draft cover art, the winner of which becomes an episode, and sometimes the runner-up too, 
and we will be having one this weekend and had one last weekend as well that you can still vote for, again over on our YouTube SFIA community tab. So that's it for today, but June has barely started. Next week we will explore how we can build enormously tall and strong structures in space towers. Then it'll be time for our Sci-Fi Sunday episode and a return to the Alien Civilization series for a look at higher dimensional aliens, and in two weeks we'll ask what it'll be like if we or some other more advanced civilization sought to construct artificial afterlives. And then in three weeks we'll celebrate SFIA's 400th regular Thursday episode with a look at life in the year 2323 AD. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.